All right, what is going on, guys? It is time for another episode of the Chasing Waypoints podcast. And, well, it is countdown to the Baja 1000. Have you guys heard the episode last week with Giovanni Spinali talking about what is coming up? And it is definitely the countdown. If you guys saw the show intro, or I should say the title of the episode, you guys know we are on the phone or going to be on the phone with none other than Andy Kirker from Score International talking about this year's event. A special one, 1,300 miles headed backwards. That's right, crews are going to be down in La Paz, racing home to Ensenada. So we're absolutely looking forward to that one. It is going to be exciting. Many of the teams already shipping out, getting that pre-running in in the early part of the week. Saw some updates, too. We know Mason Klein going to be headed to Dakar under the privateer core rally team. He's headed to Dakar, and brother Carter Klein is headed to Baja. Going to be racing with none other than Chavo Salutierra along, alongside another team. What I saw, it looks like they're going to be running the San Felipe section. So we will see. We'll Hopefully we'll check in with them We get a word from him. But we're going to be talking with Andy Kirker about this year's event and what is happening so I'm excited. What do you guys What do you guys think? Is it going to be a uh, Austrian bike up top, or are we going to be on a Honda? Is it going to be a Yamaha? Hmm? Got a lot of options this year. Honda not making it easy for anyone, and neither is KTM. So interesting to see Arturo Salas. I'll ask Andy about that one. It looks like he's going to be racing with the SLR team, so no longer on the uh, gas gas and or ktm side i don't know we'll see we'll find out a little bit more about it we'll uh, we'll ask uh we'll ask andy about it we got a couple of uh a couple of things i want to know about a couple of changes it's going to be a little bit different i saw some news uh, for those of you familiar with the weatherman and what they do they're going to be running things a little bit different so definitely want to ask about that and yeah so let's get the show started because we are counting down to the Baja 1000 just a few days away. Start turning the party down. All right. So what has everybody been doing? Have you guys been keeping up with Ikema? Seeing the updates? Kove putting out that 800X. That is going to be an interesting bike. 418 pounds, so... Uh, Right on par with the 790, 95 horsepower, a little more wheel travel. Uh, I'm going to say probably looking a little bit spicier than the uh, 790s do. Yamaha coming out with some really cool stuff as well. So it'll be interesting to see. I saw the video with Paul Torres talking about the new kits available for the T700. So let's get this turned down here. Let's give Andy a call. Is it Andy? Andy, what is up? It is Victor. Victor, how you doing, bud? Yeah, I'm doing all right. How are you, sir? I'm I'm doing great. I'm sitting here in beautiful downtown La Paz at the end of the Malacan in my hotel room where uh, actually it's called the City Express where registration is going to be and just loving it down here. Nice. All right. What, what's the weather like? Because winter apparently arrived at SoCal just in time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's far from winter. It's um, it was a balmy eighty something today. You know, we were working on some uh, race bikes and stuff, and we're sweating. So yeah, it's it's tropical. Uh, well, yeah, that's right. You guys, that humidity down there too, right? Yeah, it's 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 good. Uh, low si- or high sixties at night. Uh, you know, mid eighties in the day. You know, some humidity. A little bit of a breeze, um, but man, this town is lit up. They are so excited about the race. They're working right now. They, you know, the hurricane came in here and beat this place up pretty hard the last yeah. few weeks ago, and there's still a couple boats lying on the beach, but um, they've cleaned up everything in, in anticipation for this event. Dude, that that is, um, you know, actually, that's that was one of the things I was thinking about. It, that's pretty crazy. Usually, they're on the receiving end of these races. Right. Everybody races down to La Paz, but now it's the other way around. So yeah. They just trickle in, you know, all hours of the night, you know, <laughs> one every now and then I'll beat up with like, you know, only missing a tire or whatever, you know, <laughs> no fenders and hoods and, and yeah. So yeah. 
they limp in, they finish, and now this is the all the fanfare that we're used to seeing up in Ensenada is down. It's going to be down here. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I don't know if you've been to La Paz or not, but I, I just love this city. Yeah, I, you know, I've been more to Cabo than I have uh, to La Paz. La Paz was just a touch and go back in the Baja 2000 uh, era, mm-hmm. way back when. Uh, so I'm curious to see about that because that's uh, you know, yeah, the bringing all of the people in, everybody's got to be there, right? Most of the teams headed down. The the tourism, yeah. So there'll be a lot, a lot of, I mean, definitely a lot more than normal will be here. They're expecting a hundred thousand people here Ooh. for this event. They're even shutting down the schools. They're making it like a national holiday. Nice. Uh, they're shutting down businesses. They got the Malacan cordoned off. Um, I mean, it's such a beautiful Malacan. Lots of restaurants, and and the city's kind of cosmopolitan, so it's not as uh, like I don't know hardcore disco like like downtown in Sonata or, or maybe Cabo. I haven't been there for a while, but yeah. a little a little more like what you would expect a kind of a city to be. Not necessarily the party town that that Cabo San Lucas might be. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's yeah. Well, you'll, people will be here. They'll see. They'll come back with glowing reviews. Nice. Very nice. And th- and that's awesome that the city, I mean, I can only imagine the undertaking too, because they literally just got wiped out, but two weeks ago. Yeah, they did. That's crazy. Like I said, they, you know, they're, they ramped up. They got, I guess, called in their reserves and <laughs> cleaned this place up. You can't even tell, except like I said, there's two or three boats still scattered. Um, I guess there was just piles of boats in, from the marina, just, but, um, there's two, two or three left that are still on the bay, on the sand. They'll probably be gone during the race, but um, yeah. Nice, making progress. Okay, so I saw the posts, and that was a big one. And I know we've been a little bit since we talked, but you have been working your ass off on a purse for the Pro Moto guys. Yeah, I've got we, to start um, off with that. <laughs> okay, great. Well, if you remember the last time we talked, I kind of had a, a three tiered agenda. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I came in kind of, you know, under my own doing to try and like be a problem solver, like, because the entries were dwindling in the motorcycle classes two years ago. And I, and I kind of started this campaign to, with the race director, uh, Jose G, who's behind me 100 um, percent and said, well, we got to make the motos great again and make them come back. And what do we have to do? So I pulled a bunch of my friends and, and racers and took opinions, you know, whether they're good or bad and listened. And if you remember there, I had three areas that were, were glaring. First one was safety. Everyone was saying just too freaking dangerous. Mm -hmm. So as you know, we did a lot of things for safety, which I can recap real quick. Uh, uh, One of the major things was they, they gave me a second helicopter. They brought in a second helicopter and allow me to be in charge of it. And I have an EMT surgeon with me and the pilot. And then we, we monitor the race for the motos and 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 be a first responder for those that are down only during daylight hours though, because of Mexican law. Mm -hmm. So that was big. We did a bunch of other things, just some rule changes, um, added some uh, uh, safety things like having side-by-side volunteers come out and open up the course ahead of the bikes, make sure there's no booby traps or lock gates in front of the lead guys, have an EMT sweep and another side-by-side after the bikes have all gone through in the first 50, 100 miles. And just kind of little things. We're just adding more and more things for um, safety, and which I explained a lot last time, so I'll just kind of skim over that now. Mm-hmm. Um, just changed a few rules and made it safer. And um, that was the number one thing we did first. Then second was the exposure was the other complaint. People are saying, oh, that nobody's, you know, there's no exposure. No, you know, you go out and do this huge battle and nobody knows about it. Well, anybody's been paying attention to the score journal. It was just chock full of motorcycles last year. So every, every issue had lots of motorcycle stuff. Cycle news was back. Uh, even Dirt Bike Magazine, I mean, Motocross Action even did something on Baja, and they're a motocross magazine. Yeah. So it's, you know, we got more exposure. So then the third thing was, oh, there's no money in it. What's in it for everybody? You know, the factories are gone. They can't, you know, blah, blah. So, okay, fine. We'll get a purse for the motos, you know. And one of the um, 
one of the ideas that I kind of came up with, well, not really I came up, actually Mike Spurgeon from Taco Moto was kind of the catalyst to get the ball rolling. Uh, he was the first one because we were talking at um, the Nevada 200 and uh, we were chatting about Baja and he really wanted to get involved. And I was kind of just, you know, pouring my heart out like what I do now. And, and he reached out to me and said, Hey, I want to put up some money and let's get this purse going. You know, I'll be the first one to step up. Mm -hmm. So he did. The fact that he did kind of gave me the, the, you know, the, the encouragement to go out and get more sponsors. So what I really um, wanted to differentiate in this campaign was, no, this isn't a contingency where, okay, you got to run a sticker just right. You got to run our tire. And, you know, if you finish something in your class, we'll give you free product. No, this was full on cash. And, and we, I ended up raising $20,000 for the pro moto unlimited class. And you know, there's some, I'm getting some, you know, feedback on why I chose that class only and why I didn't spread it around. But here's what happened. I started thinking about it. I've got, I got four different primary sponsors to put up the cash. And I thought, you know what? I don't want to dilute it. I don't want to have a hundred sponsors. I don't want to have to where it looks like rolling credits on the end of a movie that nobody watches. <laughs> I wanted these four vendors yeah. to really get credit for what they did. Mm -hmm. And score was behind me hundred percent. Again, the score journal ran articles on it. Um, I ran a bunch of stuff on my social media stuff. Um, and yeah, they got a, they got a lot of bang for their buck. And so what I did, um, I decided I'm going to do it for the pro moto unlimited class only because they're the top tier moto class. Mm -hmm. There's another class that's pro moto limited. That was originally supposed to be a limited motor size and something happened there and where now it's unlimited also. So it's kind of a, basically a, a second pro class. Well, I want to differentiate from that class. I want those guys to think, Hey, we're almost as fast as these top pros. We could have been winning money. Instead, we're just sandbagging. So that'll be a give them incentive, but also give the top pro guys, um, who may have been on the fence about Baja, like, Oh, maybe I'm going to do GNCC or works instead. But now there's like incentive, you know, there's a lot, I mean, 10 grand to win this thing yeah. on top of everything else. So, um, five grand for second place, third, uh, three grand for third place two, you know, was it 1500 for fourth and 500 for fifth? I mean, it's almost like you almost guaranteed money if you finish. Yeah. Plus to get the money from score, which already has a, a prize money from the entry fees, a portion of entry fees go into that. Mm -hmm. So but this was just, you know, not, not a contingency, just a full cash purse. And, uh, yeah, so I'm really excited. I think it was w really well received, a lot of, a lot of attention. Um, and I can't wait to hand those checks out on Saturday. Dude, that's going to be, that's going to be crazy. And I mean, and hats off, I mean, both to you and, and Taco Mike, you know, stepping up first oh, and yeah. making it happen. I mean, that's, <laughs> <laughs> let me, let me mention who the other sponsors are. I, I forgot. I know. They, okay. Talk, uh, Taco Moto was the first one to step up. So I'll put him in front. Uh, New Bay, the people that bring you the Stella and the speaker devices, mm -hmm. um, it's mandatory. You got to, you got to run that product. So, I mean, for them to step up and, and, and still donate to the sport, I think it's really commendable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they didn't have to do that. They're, they got a captive audience, but they did. They wanted to give back also. And um, so, yeah, they put up five grand nice. and then um, AHM, uh, you know, motorcycle suspension and, and tuning and the, Actually, I have to run their suspension also, so I, I know those guys. And as soon as I told Brandon about what we were doing, he's like, "Yeah, you know, how much? You know, I'll, 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 I'm in. I'm in." It was really cool. Nice. And then, uh, not last but last, was um, Baja Bound uh, Auto Insurance, who's mm -hmm. a big supporter of Baja forever. Yep. I contacted them, and it, again, no resistance. They were like, "Yeah, we want to. This is a great program. We want to be on board." So it was not that hard. And I'm really proud of them. I'm proud of myself. And I, I can't wait to, to see, you know, how, how everyone reacts when they see these big checks go out. Yeah. Dude, that, I mean, it's, you know, it's and, always been the thing, right? Is like usually racing is a, is a losing proposition on the checkbook. So well, it still is at 10 grand, but yeah, but it's less losing. <laughs> it, it, it stings a little bit less, but you know what though? It's like the, the, yeah, that's right. That's, that's my check. You know, it's just, it's like the trophy. Okay. Well now there's a trophy and now there's a sizable check, you know? So well, you know, what's really cool is, um, these sponsors, you know, after seeing what 
kind of exposure scores given them and social media and the reaction of, of the writers, um, I think they're on board for more. I mean, I don't think this was a one and done. Um, so I'm going to, you know, as soon as this race is over, I'm going to start beating the drum and, and get a campaign for the whole season so that these people that, um, again, are on the fence are only cherry picking doing the thousand. Like, hey, you know what? Four races isn't that big of a deal. We could do all four and go after the, the one X plate or you know, a championship. Um, there's, you know, because really this race, this series mm-hmm. is our pinnacle. It's the Mount Everest of motorcycle racing, in my opinion. It, it is. I mean, well, Dakar, like off road, right? You got ISD going on right now. Um, obviously the Dakar rally. Few people have heard of that one. Yeah. And there's Baja- stages. Those guys sleep in cozy <laughs> bivouacs and they have catered meals. Now this is a running yeah, clock. Got, this is yeah. a badass. <laughs> These but, guys, I mean, you go out there and you have to go balls of the walls for pretty much days, two days, yeah. no sleep, hardly, you know, run at night, run at day, battle cows and people coming the other way and the terrain and silt beds and whoops and rocks. And you finish this Baja 1000, you've accomplished something. Yeah. Well, Which, think you, about it. we got 26 Iron Man signed up. That's crazy. Yeah. I mean, and there's going to be more probably. Yeah. Well, okay. So that, that's one. And, and, and something you've been working on it. One of the things is, you know, bringing the exposure back and, and 26 Iron Men. Um, obviously you guys got the, the promoto class also. I, I thought, honestly, I thought Mark Samuels was out of the game. Like they, they weren't He's really back. looking. I think, <laughs> I think this per, this purse has something to do with it. I'm, I'm uh, becoming friends with his manager mm-hmm. who, uh, we, we both have house, vacation houses down in Ensenada and we're neighbors. Yeah. And, um, you know, and so we've been talking a lot like, Hey, what do we got to do to bring Honda back? And. Mm-hmm. Uh, shoot, they're back this week and they're going to be back next year from my, I'm hoping. And, um, you know, with them there and then, you know, the, the pro class right now, it's pretty stacked. Yeah. You know, the competition is numb. I don't think anybody's going to walk away with this race. No. And the points, the points system, I don't know if he's checked the points, but it's anybody's game right now to win that. It was like the top four guys, um, depending on circumstances, any one of those top guys could end up with a championship. So it's going to be really exciting. Yeah. Well, so there was something I saw and I wanted to uh, check in. So did I, is it me or did I see uh, Arturo Salas changing up the changing bikes? Yeah, they um, decided they ended up partnering with the the Honda team and he went to Honda. uh, He's part of Samuel's team. Ooh. That's... I know. There's a weapon. <laughs> no, I see this it's getting, getting serious. Spicy. This is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. It is. And then, you know, we're talking about Iron Man numbers, but one of the things I'm really super proud of is that we crested over a hundred motorcycle and quad entries for this race so far. Nice. That hasn't been done in years. So I'm really excited that it's turned the tide has turned. I think it's really People are coming back and reckon, realizing, you know, the score and Baja racing is, is, you know, remembering why it's so unique and, and cool. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's, you've got the money, like, right. Talking about what you were just talking about, right. Your, your, I don't want to say laundry list isn't the correct term, but you know, it's, it was your, your main points of like, okay, these are the, 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 the goals, the goals, goals. The, the KPIs, key, key performance, you know, <laughs> <indicators>. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but so, right. I mean, yeah, you, you, you know, rustled the crowd, you know, got the, got sponsors, uh, to look at it. Obviously the, the, they're liking what they're seeing, uh, looking and going forward. And then the numbers are up, you know, safety wise, you've done the helicopter thing. You've got all of the, the, uh, you know, we, we were talking about one of the things, even something so simple as the light that these guys got to wear the blue light, right? You know, oh, yeah, back. yeah, just, we changed that. <laughs> the, the car helped there. <laughs> I, um, we talked about it, but the backstory on that was I happened to see um, at the Dakar race where this truck was, or this kind of you know, trophy car, or whatever you want to call it, mm-hmm. the same driver ran over two motorcycles, you know, uh, during the race and got a slap on the wrist for penalties. And I went to our race director and says, did you see that? Jesus Christ. I can't believe they're, they're car. They're running over bikes. So, um, I go, tell me we have a rule for that. And to be honest with you, we actually didn't have an, a written rule that you can't run over a bike. 
I mean, you know, I'm sure there is some way, but it's obvious that it's unsportsmanlike. <laughs> but so we, but there is a, um, a no nerfing rule that we already on the books. And because changing rules is hard. It, um, there's a lot of paperwork and a lot of, it goes, it's got to go through legal. I mean, there's, it's not just, you know, oh, we'll just change a rule. So by being able to do something else in order and, and use an existing rule was, was more attractive. So we already had a, a no nerfing rule but for like the little uh, Volkswagen class 11s and some other classes that, uh, um, that, they're, that trophy trucks and whatever else passing them are not allowed to nerf them. And so I guess because, you know, in, in that world, nerfing is, is like, hey, I'm here. I'm going to pass you. Boom, boom. Move out of my way. Mm-hmm. Well, we can't do that on motorcycles. So we're not used to that. But so so what made the, the classes that they had no nerfing because like on a Volkswagen, it destroys their, their you know, motor because it's back the there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, they had a designation where they had a blue light on the back so that the person coming up on that vehicle would recognize, oh, there's a class that I can't nerf. I just got to use a horn or whatever it is. So we adopted the no nerfing class rule, put, basically put motos and quads in that, in, you know, added them to that category where when they wear a blue light, um, you can't nerf them either. So therefore, any car running over a bike, there's an automatic DQ for, for breaking that rule, regardless of the obvious, you know, bad karma. Yeah. But um, there's a, it didn't turn out to be an interesting uh, windfall, which I, a safety windfall, which didn't even occur to me when we were dealing with all this, is that because um, the bikes still have a red light on them. Mm-hmm. So now when you're coming up and you have a red light and a blue light, and if they're separated in the dust, you know what's what now. So like if you are coming in hot and you have to make a choice of running over a light, run over the red one, not the blue one. Mm-hmm. So that you know that was a little bit of a windfall. Uh, I don't think that happens very often, but still, mm-hmm. it's it's there that they know that in the dark or whatever that the blue light is a soft target. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which is, I mean, you know, especially for this race, all the hours and all this, that the guys that the field's going to get spread out. I mean, there's just no no doubt about it. You know, with no, 1,300 miles, so they're going to catch trophy trucks are going to catch almost to the top ten. I swear, I mean, yeah. they can go so much faster the course is really rough places that are traditionally fast aren't that fast right now because they got beat up from the hurricane mm-hmm. um yeah they're gonna they're gonna the trophy trucks are gonna start catching the slower riders a lot for recently like under 400 miles man that's crazy well and and it's now we're saying it's not as fast as maybe it was before but it's still fast right i mean that's all that area down there is relatively flat when compared to San Felipe and some of the parts yeah, kind of north. Yeah, right? there's area, but there's also areas that aren't. Um, mm. I mean, uh, this is really fun down here, especially around Loretto. Some really fun terrain around there. Yeah. But over on, and then on the west coast, over by Insurgentes, um, Punta Canejo. Well, Punta Canejo is really fast. That's pretty far south. It's some really fast stuff. But northern Constitution, um, uh, you know, up in the like maybe 200 mile marks. Um, there's some really long ass whoop sections in there. You, you know, I remember the first time I had that section a few years ago. I remember the first time I ran it. It's like, oh my god, there was a ten, no, a fifteen mile straight, no, ten mile straight away. Then you turn right, and another five miles of solid whoops. I'm like, this is relentless. Ten miles straight with you know fence line, straight as an arrow road of nothing but whoops. And I was just donking along, and I'm in third gear, like just suffering. And then I changed my suspension a little bit and cranked up to some, some compression and was able to get into fifth gear and kind of pound them harder. Mm-hmm. And in fifth gear, you're going 60 miles an hour through them. And then there's 15 miles is only 15 minutes. And um, so like, I can do this. Yeah. Now, okay. Speaking of which you just kind of reminded me of something and I, and, and I caught a glimpse of it and I didn't know what to think about it. Did I see a Jersey with your name on it? <laughs> yeah, the cat's out of the bag. <laughs> yeah, I actually am racing um, and working this race. Um, I'm uh, fortunate to a friend of mine, Kevin Ward, and my good buddy Jeff Kaplan. Uh, we've been get, we've been friends since teenagers, and now we're in our late sixties. Mm-hmm. Um, we uh, they're doing a sixty class team, and and they they gave me a small section to do. I'm doing the start for them, nice. um, and I'm really grateful and, and fun because because this is such a big race and i'm down here early i'm you know got here this morning and uh, i got time to free run before all the you know work starts and being starting the race at one o'clock um 
and I'm only doing, um, you know, less than a hundred miles. So, um, it's in the dark and I'll be finished and then, uh, I'll move forward up the coast and, uh, meet up with a helicopter at daybreak and do my day job. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> yeah. Nice. So nice. So that's good. So yeah, it's fun. I am looking forward to it, to be part of it without being, you know, having to put in tremendous amount of miles and, but, um, yeah, I'm just racing. So yeah, yeah. But even which is cool. I mean, even those. I mean, those sixty miles. I mean, every mile is going to count on this on this one, and especially for for the bike guys. You know, in the truck, you can you can wheel it off and be a little bit loose, and and you're still not losing a lot of pace. But a bike, it does not. You know, it demands it commands that you have to be on it. You can't relax in the whoops, or it's a really long day. You know, no. You I mean, you're can't. concentrating. I mean, yeah. Yeah, it's it's an old saying, but. You know, you are you are making ten thousand decisions per mile that uh, try not to die. You know, you're 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 just laser focused on every little pebble in front of you and ledge, rut, rock, bush. You know, everything. You're just making constantly making pretty much subconscious decisions, but you're you're just calculating the whole time and just picking and optimizing the course in front of you. And um, you know, I. I love night riding because it changes the way it looks. You get shadows that aren't there during the day and, um, uh, you know, you're playing in the dust, it's challenging. You're trying to find little pockets or little clear pockets to try and dive through to try and gain a, a little advantage on the guy in front of you. And, mm-hmm. uh, and then you get up close to him. And then it's, then it's that 30 seconds of got to go for it and take a chance to get up to him. So you're above his desk at his wheel level. And then, then you got him. but it's all, you know, it's, it's fun. <laughs> That's why I'm excited about going back out there. Yeah. All these, it's all these little, like you said, these, these micro decisions, you know, it just changes it. And so one of the things uh, with me doing the start also is um, there's a couple uh, movies being filmed at this race from what I understand. And one of them is, um, you know, I've given permission to, to film and so I know they might, they might try and film me and, and what, you know, the, what I'm doing there during the night and then during my day job too, a little bit, they might shadow me. So that would be cool. That works out some kind of, a kind of a dust for glory type movie. Nice. And, um, and another movie, I can't remember the name of the company that or type of movie is a different, I think it's more of a car oriented, uh, movie, but anyways, it's, so if you all remember what Dust for Glory did for bomb racing, well, hopefully, you know, a couple more movies coming back out and glorifying um, what we do, um, showcasing it, um, will just bring the enthusiasm again, like where it used to be. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it was interesting. We were talking to uh, Giovanni Spinale yesterday, or not yesterday, but for last week's episode. And, and that was something that he said that I think that was a good point is that, you know, you could the smart money is 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 a dirt bike, dirt bike, some suspension, a desert tank and some good lights. And oh, yeah, and you're pretty much in business. I mean, or you could go. I mean, I don't know. Nowadays, it seems like even a class 11, aside from it being a really, really long day in the desert, they, they, those things are expensive. <laughs> well, think about it. I mean, and the dirt bikes don't break. They're so bulletproof nowadays. You yeah. know, it's I've always tell people a dirt bike, a modern dirt bike is probably, you know, top 10, one of the best deals in the world mm-hmm. for bang for your buck. And, and the kind of, a, I mean, you could take a stock motorcycle off the showroom floor and race it. Uh, and probably, I mean, someone in the like supercross, whatever could probably do, you know, who's a typical, like a winning guy could still do top five with a stock bike probably against, you know, the top pros of the world because the bikes are that good now and they're that reliable and they, you can get, you can spend 10 grand on a bike and it'll last you five years if you're not, you know, serious racer. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, no, that, it's a great, you know, that and a pair of Levi's is probably the best deal in the world. Yeah. <laughs> as far as lasting and, and being able to make well, yeah, it happen. Well, yeah, you know, $50 jeans last you three years, you know. Yeah. I mean, Starbucks is five with six bucks for a cup of coffee last you 15 minutes. <laughs> but we yeah. talked about the cost of racing, the race Baja, um, you know, first of all, the danger level is tr- you know, there's no comparison that, you know, it's the most dangerous for the motos. Mm-hmm. But the money wise, you could get a team of five guys in an age group class and I'll ship in a couple grand each and do this race mm-hmm. and have a bike. And then you still got a bike when you're done. You know, you, 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 don't, you don't wear it completely. I mean, you got to rebuild it, but you, know, you still got something that's, you know, you can re- return on your investment. And then 
compare that to a trophy truck who probably spends 50 grand just on fuel. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Their fuel budget is an entire, you know, motorcycle team's race budget for a year almost, I would think. Yeah, for yeah. sure. <laughs> Which is crazy. No, so, but the biggest thing, you know, everyone talks about, oh, with age comes a cage and all that, you know, well, yeah, and, and people that have raced dirt bikes who now are, are race car drivers, you know, one of, one of them comes to mind is, you know, Larry Rossler and mm -hmm. some of the other ones, but, you know, yeah, they're great at picking lines and, and being a great driver. And I tried it. I tried getting into a car and, and doing it. And it's really fun, but it's not as fun as riding a dirt bike. Yeah. And the biggest difference to me is in a dirt bike, you're using your whole body and your body is influencing the handling of your vehicle where I think really your brakes and your steering wheel, are the only thing you're influencing your car over, it's more about setting it up in your van. I could be wrong. So I'm not a car guy, but, but it was really, I really missed that body English that we do on a dirt bike. Mm -hmm. Um, and the influence we have on, on the, on the, you know, the handling that our body does where I didn't really get that in a car. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, I, yeah. I feel like in the car, it's like your, your body turns into sensors. It's more of a sensor based type deal. That's oh, a good analogy. Yeah. yeah. I feel a little more pressure over here. Oh, that's breaking loose. Oh, it's this and that. But on a dirt it's bike. More it's, analytical perhaps too. It may yeah. be like, you know, like NASCAR, they're constantly analyzing what the car is doing so they can adjust it in the pits, but maybe they do that in Baja. I don't know, but. But, you know, as long as I can ride a dirt bike, I'm sticking with dirt bikes. <laughs> Which is, you know, actually, you know, come to think about it, the amount of suspension, the amount of shocks that are on any one given corner of these is almost the price of a retail dirt I imagine, bike. yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can get a coilover and a bypass for the price of, you know, the latest and greatest KTM. Almost. I don't know. I haven't checked. The, <laughs> I haven't checked the bike prices. I know the dealerships are getting pretty proud of their. Uh, of yeah, their I mean it's so dirt bikes. I'm, you know, they're re it's really fun. Baja racing is really fun on a dirt bike. Pre running is really fun on a dirt bike, although it is sort of dangerous. Yeah. Um, you know, you got to slow down when you're pre running. Mm -hmm. There's no point. It's not pre racing. It's pre running. You race when it's the race time. Yeah. But um, yeah, we already had a couple injuries out on the course and. You know, and we haven't, we're not even, you know, two days away still. Yeah. I, I actually, you know, the, um, I was literally like, you know, I'm just like, uh, killing a little bit of time and I was scrolling through and dude, the, the pro moto, uh, Facebook group, I noticed oh, that yeah. the, the posts and all of that stuff. That's, I think that's grown like huge. And I feel like, especially for this race. It is. And it's, um, if you recall two years ago when we were, we were experimenting with a rally class is when I thought, Oh, let's make a Facebook group for the rally class. And it started grabbing um, some attention. Um, and people were, and it's like, wow, there's like, you know, eight people have, have signed up already. You know, it's like, it's really cool. And then, um, you know, fast forward, uh, the rally class didn't take, it was an experiment the score was willing to do. And I commend them for that. And, um, I must have misread, misread the room or whatever, but it, it just didn't grasp. So we, we abandoned it for now mm -hmm. uh, or shelved it, I should say. Um, but I, I changed the name of the group to just pro moto Baja racing. Mm -hmm. And, and I want you know, my original vision of it after I, you know, adjusted the group was to have a place that riders can, could, talk to each other, talk about the score, talk about rules. Um, with my involvement in score, it, um, it gives, and I'm kind of an open book or open door. I mean, a, a window, whatever you want to call it. Um, they have a, they have an avenue for, I can voice their opinions to people that are listening to me mm -hmm. and make changes. And I've already done that, um, as we've talked about earlier. And so I wanted it to be a sounding board. I wanted it to be a place for people to exchange information. I wanted to be, you know, showing off free run videos. Uh, it's a great place to get the word out about rule changes, course changes, hazards. Um, people broke down, kind of like the weatherman, but online um, a little bit. And um, it's been growing and growing, and it's really starting to function how I envisioned it. And I really see it this race where we had injuries and people are coordinating and getting. Uh, you know, chase crews that go out to race miles 795 and, and, you know, pick up a downed rider. And we're, it's just like crowdsourcing um, all these people that are knowledge about Baja. And, and 
uh, have parts or different places. And now with Starlink, you know, everybody's a lot more people are, are can be online in the middle of the desert. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Stay connected. So, yeah. The group is growing and we're, we're surpassed 7,000 at this point, um, uh, members and, uh, Different. I have different moderators. It's not just the Andy Kirker show. It's um, you know we have well-known moderators: Scott Harden, Tim Tim Morton, uh, well-known uh, people. Car guys are are chiming in on on making comments because it is becoming a great place to get information quickly from Score mm-hmm. um, as it as it occurs, and um, sometimes a little too quick, or they get mad at me if I. Let's let the cat, you know, <laughs> jump the gun on something that they weren't ready to release yet. Like, yeah. um, I, I, when I found out about the score tequila, I posted it, but I was 15 minutes early. So Oops. I got in trouble, but that's all right. <laughs> I understand. Um, they have a plan. I don't, I'm, you know, just kind of running around doing my thing and, and just, and I'm doing it because all I want to do is promote this because I love this sport and I want people to, you know, have the enthusiasm and enjoy it like I do. And um, I really think the whole attitude, it's been a, a shift. And I think that there was a lot of score bashing a few years, a couple of years ago. And, and when, and a lot of that comes from just not understanding, you know, like, Oh, so many VCPs over here. Well, now with me being on the inside, I find out, yeah, because there's a farm over here that has a farm road and we had to just, you know, jump through so many hoops to get permission and we had to guarantee that we weren't going to race on that farm road Mm -hmm. so it's really important but nobody nobody knows those stories until kind of now they get you know i'll voice it i'll tell them yeah which is yeah that's very it's an interesting thing right it's yeah something happens and there's about six different theories that come out within 32 seconds of of a change first thing everyone always says oh it's all about the money Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah yeah and which is you know, it's it, it's sad to see, you know, that it that it goes that way, but it's cool when the information gets disseminated and then people will like, oh, okay, cool, got it. You know, and, and kind of understand that it is. And and it's I've I've been I'm not gonna say like I have intimate knowledge of, you know, course design and, and negotiating with the, the landowners and stuff like that, but it is an absolute undertaking to to be able to to do that and get that so yeah, I mean, sometimes, yeah, you're not going to be able to um, go through certain areas. And, and that's just not simply because it's a money thing. It's it's other things. I mean, I've I've been in places where they told us you need to move because you guys are dusting this crop. And with that, yeah. you're you're screwing this up like there's other ramifications to it. Yeah, it's a money thing, but we're not we're looking at it in the wrong way money way it's not that the landowner didn't get paid it's literally that this is going to cost the landowner he, he otherwise wouldn't care you know you know everyone thinks oh there's so much money the entry fees i know the entry fees are expensive but if you compare them to some of the other highest tier sports i mean you know I mentioned a car the car it costs you a minimum 100 grand to campaign a bike and mm-hmm. you know so i don't know what the entry fee is but it's more than what baja is yeah. um then you know i know from yeah, you know, the people that are working at Score, I you know they do it for the love of it. And um, you know, Roger is he loves off road racing. He loves what we're doing. I, you know, I don't think this is a huge money maker for him. It, it's you know, I think it's it's a business that does okay. Mm-hmm. But I think you know, people think I think they overestimate you know or underestimate what it takes to put on one of these races. Yeah. This is a thirteen hundred mile long race. We probably have 700 course workers. I think that just a t-shirt bill alone that score is putting out, you yeah. know, for the course workers, yeah. the forest insurers. Yeah, um, that'd be an interesting number cost per mile. Not that we need to know it, but I guess, I guess some people need to understand too, is that, Hey, in business, even if you do make a lot of money, you may have another business that you need to generate a write off. Write off. <laughs> so, yeah, that too. But well, yeah. you know, when speaking of mile, you um, you know, when you say when you divide the entry fee over miles, it's not that expensive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you know, like you mentioned earlier, right? You get you get a team going. Everybody pitches in. It's it's worth it. Like I, me myself, I look at it. I look at the entry fee and I think, like, damn, I, you know, there's no way I could come up with that amount of money. But if you start putting together the math and you start getting a few people in, it's worth the price of admission. I mean, if, if well, other than right, the Iron I mean, Man, right. 
<laughs> those guys, I mean, I feel for them, but here's the best part about it. First of all, 26 guys, that's going to be a sizable prize for whoever wins it um, because of their entry fee money mm-hmm. and that goes into the purse. Um, but the, um, yeah, they have the, they have their, sh- the shoulder, the burden of the cost because they don't have teammates, unfortunately. Yeah. But, but as we're growing again, and we're getting exposure again, and hopefully it makes it, and we've got movies being made again, hopefully this will make it easier for them to get sponsorship because now the sponsorships are, are, are going to get a little more for it than just, you know, being part of the love of the sport. Um, but yeah. Um, so, but if you think about it, motorized sports in general are expensive. And so to be able to race a top tier race for a few grand mm-hmm. um, and do a section of it, um, I mean, skiing, I mean, you know, lift tickets cost over a hundred bucks. You go like six times. That's it. You know, mm-hmm. for the day. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's people bitch about the money and stuff, but it's a, it's a luxury sport to be able to do this. Yeah. yeah and you just, but it's really cheap compared to, to most of the motorized sports. Most of the other stuff. Well, yeah. I mean, and then that's, a, I guess, you know, really looking at it, right. That's the, that's the thing you're going to get more than likely for the price that you have to chip in you're going to get the miles you can handle. I mean, yeah. it's, it's not like, man, well, you know, I only got 200 miles. No, you're going to pay for those 200 miles. <laughs> you're going to pay in other ways too. 200 miles yeah. is enough. Let me tell yeah. you. That's I know plus. that's the, you know, that's the thing. It's like, you know, you're, it's not, um, it's being part of the team. It's, it's covering that kind of stuff, you know, and it, it can be done. I've seen it in, in multiple. Yeah. I, you know, I agree. It, it sucks for the Ironman in, in that they have to come up with it, but, I kind of feel just like how the pro moto guys are getting that exposure and getting that money. The other end, that Iron Man guy is getting looked at because it is like, okay, these guys has got well, a cool team. They're the pro guys, but you got those Iron Man guys, those guys, you know, that kind of, I well, feel like, like we that. were successful in raising money for the pro moto unlimited class. It was just mm-hmm. a start. So now, you know, hopefully we can expand it. Hopefully they get enough. They're, they're happy with the exposure that we've provided so far and hopefully post race there's even more. And if we can increase this campaign and, and I even stopped, I, I mean, I could have been, I had a big hit list. And once I hit four vendors, I stopped because it was running out of time. It was more important to get it out there and announced than it was to increase that purse. And again, I didn't want to, I didn't want to dilute the, the pool, yeah. but maybe, you know, as we move forward, we can do series and race sponsors, you know, things that, um, I don't know. It's just, it, it, it was more, it wasn't, um, what I'm trying to say, I didn't get the door slammed in my face. Like I was expecting, I'm in sales you know, in, in my real job and stuff, mm-hmm. and, but, and I, and I was thinking, you know, that this is going to be, it was, it was more, it was more well received than I expected. It was, it was like, because the people that are in it, they're in the sport and they get it. And they were like, yeah, we're with you. Let's, let's, we want to be a part of this. And so it wasn't that hard of a sell. It was easy. And I, you know, it, so I'm hoping that next year I can, you know, in, increase on this effort gets, you know, at least duplicated in each race and maybe get a series sponsor kind of thing. And, and really uh, make this one of the, or the premier moto sport. And get it, get it back. I'm in, you know, continue to grow it and get it back to and go beyond what it, what it was before we had, you know, you had all the factory teams here. And again, if we think about the numbers, which is pretty cool, you know, we hit a hundred. I don't think we've seen a hundred since the early two thousands. Um, and that was a goal of mine. I think, you know, when I, when I was really concerned that we were on the endangered species list, I think we had like 35 bikes in the class, in the race, like 500. Mm-hmm. I'm like, this is bad. You know? So to be able to triple the amount of entries in two years. Mm-hmm. And then if you think about not only is it cool that, you know, yeah, we're, we're growing and I think we're even going to grow more, but what the, what a hundred represents there's three right now to date, there's 322 entries total for the thousand. And a hundred and uh, just just over a hundred entries is motos and quads. We represent a third of the entry now. Mm-hmm. That's huge. That was not. Yeah, that was. It most was definitely oh, you know, score doesn't care about bikes. Well, mm-hmm. think about it. if you're in business and a third of your clientele are bikes, you care about them. Yeah, but they do care. Everyone, everyone had that myth. I don't know why, but yeah. but from you know, as soon as I got involved, 
um, the second time. So I was involved with style and, and the, the other score too for five years mm-hmm. and, and involved with timing and scoring. But as soon as I got reinvolved again, um, well, I don't know where that myth came from that a score doesn't care. A score does care about the motos. They care. And the motos are the most taxing on the organization because they're the ones that get hurt. They're the ones that have distress calls. They're the ones that, that break down and, and are sitting in the middle of nowhere you know, exposed by themselves. Um, they don't, you know, they don't have the equipment that a car has. They don't have the powerful radios. And so then now this, that brings us to another subject. This race is going to be different and it's going to be a, an adjustment for everybody. Um, the weatherman, Scott, who's going to be um, commentating, but it's not going to be on a, on a, on a radio station. Um, because UHF radios are, you know, 1999, you know, they're not, yeah. that's not the future. So they've switched over to satellite um, texting and voice calls to call in your emergencies and your statuses. And there's group text um, out there that uh, we created some WhatsApp groups that people can share common knowledge. Um, you can text, if you're on a team, you can text the weatherman and he'll text back with a status. Um, so it's going to be different. It's not going to be as fun at first. It's going to be adjustment. Everyone's going to bitch about it for a while, but um, it's what it is. But as we're stepping into the satellite era, um, so many Starlinks out there. Scores got a fleet of them. Mm-hmm. Pretty soon, it'll be every mile will be a Starlink that'll be broadcasting live and what's going on. We'll have the Baja One Thousand in our living room. Yeah. So it's it's an adjustment period. But that's what's happening. There's a Shoot, I don't have the phone number in front of me. I like a broadcaster right now, but um, I get it to you. It's on our, it's on the Pro Moto Bar Racing. It's on Scores website. That to the number to call, it's a, I think it's a five six two number, mm-hmm. and it's a, it's a, a U.S. phone number that you just either satellite call or, or if you have internet, you just call the cell phone and, and report whatever you need to report. Yeah, if you see a downed rider or whatever, it's the same kind of thing. Just that it's not going to have all the Weather man isms of you know, yeah. <laughs> what was that? Uh, you know, the status Richard updates, so, and, yeah. <laughs> and the stuck the, mics. You're the not stuck hear mics anything, for you know six all hours. The music while you know yeah. while someone's you know we got a code red going on, and then you hear all you hear is margaritas machines going off in yeah. the background. And it always seems like it, it's it was a Murphy's Law thing. It always yes. seemed to be right around the time that the channel was code red, or or any time. I guess that's the other one that I, uh, you know, that I remember very kind of almost specifically with that is like every time that the channel was code red, nobody, like there was always that handful of people that didn't hear it. And they're like, yeah. Oh, there's nobody talking right now. Let me, you know, and it just one after the other, after the other. And, and I mean, minutes are critical, which is, you know, I, I agree. I, I've, I've switched over now in the, in the rally stuff that we've been doing. We've been doing a lot of push to talk satellite. Yeah. That's what this was really intended for. Unfortunately yeah. though, um, we got a lot of push back from the bikes because it's another device that they didn't want to carry mm-hmm. and another expense. I mean, to have those push to talk networks, um, you know, it's an investment. And, um, so for, I was able to modify the rule because it was going to be a satellite phone mandatory um, along with all the other equipment. I was able to modify the rule to where it was a um, satellite texting device rather than satellite phone. Mm-hmm. But that allows us to use um, InReach or Spot or Spot X, I guess it would be mm-hmm. uh, Zolio. Um, but let's, let's touch on how you do contact weatherman. Yeah. So if you are on let's say i'll start with a racer mm-hmm. if you're a motorcycle racer if you're by yourself on the motorcycle the primary uh, way to communicate in, a, in an emergency is with a stella device mm-hmm. that's on your handlebars and you push the two buttons simultaneously for three seconds and that'll be a, a co- uh, an alert to, to score ops and you know, they'll be able to communicate back and forth through satellite if you crash on your motorcycle and you're separated from your motorcycle, mm-hmm. it's mandatory to carry a speaker device, which is very similar to the Stella, just a little smaller um, recorder device, has the same capabilities, um, 
pretty much. Again, you had carry, it's mandatory to carry it on their body. So if you crash and you can't crawl back to your bike, you can reach into your pack and pull out the speaker, do the same thing, hit two buttons, three seconds, and communicate with score that way. If you can't communicate, you hit that button. Or if somebody comes upon you mm-hmm. and, and sees an unconscious rider, Somehow they can put, they can touch their Stella or send it or their speaker and send the alert and score will know exact coordinates and everything and send the chopper to go, to go find them. Mm -hmm. So those two devices are mandatory from score. Everybody carries a cell phone. um, So you've got the ability to communicate occasionally on cell service or through, you know, if you happen to be at a pit that's got Starlinks in it, you can ask for the Wi-Fi code and, and contact people through your cell phone. Mm-hmm. If um, if that doesn't work, then then the satellite texting device that you carry, which most people already have an InReach or a SpotX or a Zolio. Anyways, if you're an off-road rider, you should have one. Yeah. So that's a, another satellite texting device that you can communicate with Weatherman through that number we just talked about. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's mo- it's, it's multi-layered uh, ability to communicate in an emergency. So we've got redundant ways to communicate. You have two Stella and speakers. You have cell phones. You have a texting device, satellite texting device. And is there any more? I can't think. Some it's up to like five. Some people will carry a sat phone, so yeah. the additional one. Yeah, which uh, you know, I uh, I don't know. Right. I, I kind of think that if it was, um, you know, getting a hold of your team, especially on a bike and I, I'm not sure how many of the bike guys were actually, I know that, uh, I think it was sat phone store or Satellite the, the North. One, one of them was working on like on a, on a bike push to talk sat system or setup. Right. Yeah, I, I investigated that when this was becoming a rule, and yeah. I got quotes from them. Uh, one package was the the very minimum was a little over three hundred dollars, mm-hmm. but the the nice package that really is the one you'd want to get was a couple grand. Um, and again, that's another expensive. We go on top of everything else we've done. So right now it's an adjustment period. It might be the way to go, um, you know. But for now, it's not as mandatory as it was a couple months yeah. ago. Yeah, I'm, you know, and and uh, I don't know, carrying even just carrying it. I don't know. I, I'm I'm a big fan of communication. I'm, you know, I'm with you. You know, you, cell phones, uh, sat com device. You know, in reach. Uh, I I just went with in reach. Um, all of these, all of these things. You know, anything you can. I mean, in the rally world, it's rally comp. Um, you know, mm-hmm. obviously in this stuff, yeah. it's it's the Stella. So the more the merrier. You know, a truck is not a big deal. You know, you, you're safe. You've got a cage. You can uh, yeah. camp out inside. And the bike, it's it's you and the elements. So, yeah, any anything you can do, you know. And it's hard to reach. I mean, some of this part, these courts are desolate. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's hard to, when you're racing, you, know, you got to keep that in mind. You got to be safe somehow. I don't know, because it's, you know, to be out in the middle of nowhere like we are, and to have a serious injury, if it happens at night, we can't fly in. We're not allowed to fly helicopters at night mm-hmm. in, in Mexico. Yeah. Um, so you're gonna, have, it's gonna be, you know, some time before a, a ground crew can get to you. Yeah. Um, but yeah. that's, you know, the risk we've always taken. I've been doing this since the '70s, and it's always been dangerous. Yeah. Um, but you learn a skill how to uh, how to uh, behave and how to be smart and, and race smart, fast, but not that. You know, you don't have to be stupid fast. You have to be smart fast yeah yeah i mean 1300 miles isn't going to be won by you know somebody that literally pinned it the whole way it's you're gonna have to be smart you know well it's always been the thing back in the 70s or 80s some some motocrossers would come over and try and do baja and they would always wad up you know they would always crash themselves out because they just don't know how to govern themselves because they're used to pinning it so hard in moto Mm -hmm. but um Go well, yeah, right now, if we've got some injuries in pre-running, I'm disappointed that uh, that happens because it's avoidable pretty much. Maybe not, but I don't know the circumstances. But, yeah. you know, it, yeah, it's just slow down in pre-running. You don't need to go fast. Yeah. Yeah, that's always the, you know, it's, I don't know, it was testing or any of these things. I mean, it's always the, the uh, what are this, what's that? Was? It was always the last ride of the day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's the one you got to watch out for. One more run. Just but, one more uh, run. Yeah, but dude, oh, that's you know, awesome. Yeah. One other thing we're talking about, all the devices. Um, 
Another thing to realize is that this race for the motorcycle, since we start at 1 a.m., mm-hmm. the majority of this race, except for 10 hours, is at night. Yeah. So that means we're carrying battery packs for, for auxiliary headlights on our helmets. So it's just one more thing that we got to carry. So having a sat phone, having batteries, having speakers, having water, having tools, on, you know, it's just more stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, you know, and I, I'm just thinking about that, right? Like, how do you, how would you go about managing that stuff? Knowing that, knowing that, yeah, the majority of the race is going to be at night. Obviously, you want to have a killer light set up, but then you start thinking like maybe tools. Like I'm thinking tools. Yeah. It's like, well, why well, would everybody carry a toolkit? Maybe, all right, guys, don't carry tire irons. We're going to hide those on the bike. Don't carry. Well, yeah, there's yeah. certain things. That's what every team's got their own, own, you know, uh, list is that's so for me for instance i do a lot of dual sporting um i have a one of those uh packs that, uh, i can't even think of it climb makes it you know so mm-hmm. it's got the pouches up front and the back and, oh, yeah. and it's pretty good pads really balanced but i you know i have i'm a boy scout i have all my what ifs in there mm-hmm. and um you know contingency for everything mm-hmm. and my pack weighs 12 pounds i can't race with 12 pounds um if I'm a Baja racer, but for dual sporting, you know, there's no excuse to not be prepared. Mm-hmm. You don't, you're not racing dual sporting, but yeah. so 12 pounds is too much. So you got the pair. I have to figure out what I'm going to give up for when I race my, you know, few miles I'm going to do, mm-hmm. but yeah, it's, you got pits every 50 miles, but, um, you know, it'll happen right between them and you got to get the bike. <laughs> it's going to have the goal. Everyone's goal is to finish. <laughs> Everyone's goal is to finish. So you got to, you know, get there yeah um one of the other things we always say in the driver's meetings is um you know you're not going to win this race in the first five miles but you certainly can lose it there if you just jump on and on a bike cold and try and haul ass without kind of settling in and getting your groove going before you start really starting to you know ramp it up yeah yeah i mean it's it i don't even know if that far you can be literally two turns from the pit and blow a corner and end up in a rock yeah they have (laughs) i mean you know it's it's uh it's great i i come from the car side you know more or my baja experience was more in car racing and that was the same you know hot driver cold car you know suspension's not ready for you and <laughs> yeah, all you're thing. right you end up going on a ride you know uh so it's uh yeah i, well, I love racing there's all these isms like that yeah. you know <laughs> <laughs> you know we use the for baja you know as a motor oil guy you know you're turning is everything but in baja we have this we are saying kind of you know, easy and hard out. You know, in other words, don't go in too hot and blow a corner because, you know, there's 10,000 corners that you have to do in a Baja race. Mm-hmm. So if you go in and accelerate hard out, that you're controllable. Going in too hot is not as controllable. Yeah. Um, you end up blowing a corner. So you're trying to, as you're racing, you know, a pro level, you're trying to get an advantage of you know, hundreds or tenths of a second every corner um, as you execute each corner. But if you blow a corner and you fall off your bike, you've lost 30 seconds minimum. Um, now you've got 10,000 corners to make up that 30 seconds again. Yeah. So yeah, easier, a little bit easy in going in and then, you know, get some, uh, you know, rail the outside of a berm, whatever, and then really accelerate out. That's, that's what the ism comes from easy and hard out. Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting, I mean, it, it makes, obviously it makes perfect sense. And then you start coming in hot, you start blowing corners, you know, you're, you get frustrated, you start pushing a little bit harder, you start blowing more corners coming in. You start in. making mistakes and now you're now you, and then anytime you, you do go off course, especially if you're not intending to, I mean, you could be in a huge boulder field and, and destroy the bike. Yeah. You go down in boulders and you ruin radiators, you crack cases, uh, you, you break bones. I mean, now you've done, what have you done to your team? All that effort because you did a stupid thing on a corner. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, like we've said before, Baja is very patient. So <laughs> <laughs> she's still yeah. there. She's still there. will always be there, you know, waiting for you to, you know, loosen up a little bit, you know, think you got it made and, and then bam, you know. So, but yeah, I think it'll be, I mean, either way it's, I, I think a lot of the teams have already, you know, especially the top teams have figured it out. Unfortunately, unfortunately they push themselves, you know, between themselves. And so that's going to make some competitive racing for sure. 
This can be good. You know, we got a lot of rookie t- uh, people, first time ever signing up for this race. They picked the, the hardest one that I've seen in years <laughs> to, to, as their baptism. But, um, yeah. you know, more power to them because it is an accomplishment. You yeah. finish this race, you've done something. Uh, yeah. a life, something, it's a once, you know, for a lot of people, it's a once in a lifetime thing. But yeah. I don't care who you are. And, and the ability to be able to be a top pro in, in your prime, in your 20s or even 30s, but to be able to do the age group classes, I'm in like late 60s now, and I'm, I'm still feel like a little kid again, being all giddy about racing. You can, I'm really excited. You can tell by this interview. That a little, I'm just a little pumped, bit of that, you know, for those, this race. A little bit of those green flag nerves, you know, the, the, <laughs> yeah, a tiny bit. I, you know, I've had a lot of green flags. <laughs> I'm ready. I'm just, just excited to be racing again. It's, I, it's been a couple of few years since I've raced a Baja race. So. Yeah. Well, I so, put all my effort into volunteering and now, you know, I get a little bit of both because of this race it allows me to do both without losing my, my seat in the helicopter. Yeah. Yeah. Being able to start in the, in the dark for a little bit and then, and then mosey your way on up the, okay. So what does that, you know, kind of wrapping it up, but what does this week look like? I mean, you're down there early, right? You're, um, yeah, I'm going to do some pre-running tomorrow, um, daytime and do my section once or twice in the daytime and then hit it a couple of times at night so that, um, you know, all my marks and everything will be acclimated to what the actual conditions will be. Um, so I got this weekend to do that. Uh, Monday, I'll, I'll just be a tourist. I think and enjoy being here in La Paz and, um, you know, do some nice dining and maybe, you know, lay on the beach. I don't know. I'm just going to just relax. Tuesday's um, uh, tech inspection for the bikes. And then Tuesday night, is it Tuesday night? Yeah. I have a riders meeting. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, Monday night we have a score, a score staff party, which is always fun for us. Nice. Um, good muckety mucks. You know, I can bring some of the sponsors and stuff that helped out. They can come sample some of that score tequila, that the score bar 1000 tequila. That's really good. And nice. just kind of sneaks up on you. <laughs> um, you know, they, it's, it's something that uh, Roger and Elise uh, do for the staff. It's really nice. And I really appreciate it. Um, but uh, so Wednesday night, I mean, well, Wednesday, really Wednesday night's the race for us, you know, one o'clock, basically 13 o'clock on Wednesday or mm-hmm. one o'clock on Thursday is, is, um, you know, the race and then i'm gonna you know <laughs> for me to get home it's gonna be um you know on a bike in a van in a helicopter in a van back in the helicopter back in a bike i don't know who knows what yeah. <laughs> it's gonna be just, yeah the amazing race back yeah well and that you know and that's an interesting thing and and that was something that joanne mentioned too is like it really does the race really does start wednesday night because you're up at if you're you you know green green flags at one a.m., that means uh, I think I saw that uh, lineup is at midnight, which means yeah. ten o'clock at night you're waking up. Or I, I don't know anybody. No, that, it's, yeah. it's going to be so hard to sleep. I don't know. You know, I, I want getting sleep. Yeah, but since I, <laughs> I'm not doing, I'm not racing all night. You know, um, I think I'll be fine. But I could sleep in the van as we're getting, you know heading to Loretto. Yeah. But. Um, yeah, it's gonna. It's a tough one. I mean, really, nobody's gonna get the kind of sleep that they would want to have. So everybody's gonna go to that line, that starting line, you know, a little off their game and tired. Mm-hmm. But they're all gonna be that way. Yeah, ball is the equalizer. It'll, it'll it'll shake itself out. It is. Ab- absolutely is. <laughs> Are you coming down? No, nah, unfortunately, I was not able to. I might uh, sneak down. I'm gonna finish at least. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. I might be able to sneak down on uh, Thursday night. Uh, I just got to make sure I don't have any cars that I got to prep for, for Friday rental, but, uh, yeah, yeah you can stay at my place. I'll let you, you know, you can yeah. hang out. Nice. Yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah. That's, uh, you know, it's been a while since I've been down to one of these races. It's, uh, it's getting time and that would be cool because it's, you know, the thousand coming back. Right. That's it is. The, I think what's really slightly different is like when someone does a thousand, the traditional Ensenada La Paz, you know, say your starting rider does 100 or 200 miles. Mm-hmm. Well, he gets off the bike at San Felipe. He doesn't go to La Paz. You know, he just goes home. Yeah. He's already in L.A. In, in his bed while the bike is still racing. Mm-hmm. Wakes up the next morning to see how he did. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> now everybody's going to be coming. Most of the teams or half of them will be down here. They're all going to start working their way forward. And as, as they start picking up teammates along the way, there'll be bigger and bigger caravans heading to Ensenada. Mm-hmm. Ensenada is going to be a huge finish. Yeah. It's going to be fun. 
Yeah, that's, you know, and that's a really good point. And I'm just thinking, you know, on the strategy side of it, you got all these guys, you got a, a, a team of six riders, five, six riders. If that was the case before, it's like, okay, well, now our team of six riders is down to five. And actually, it's really down to four to get the last part of the peninsula down because these guys could only ride these two days and then headed back north. Now it's the other way around. So maybe. Some, now you got lots of replacement riders all kind of catching up with the bike. You, know? you do. And you're going to have fresh yeah. replacement riders rather than somebody that's got a trail. Yeah, so ride. It's a it. different strategy. It is. That's going to be an interesting, I, I hadn't thought about that, but there's, I think there's going to be a lot there's of, there's a lot to this race. that's <laughs> going to be never done before. And I, my hat's that. off to score and my hat's off to the mayor or the governor of La Paz that, that really was enthusiastic about it. I mean, I'm just stoked. You can tell I'm just really pumped. This race is going to be so cool. Yeah. What, um, okay. So between you, me, the fence post and our listeners, what do you think about this becoming a regular thing? Would you like to see it, you know, ran this way, La Paz North? Or I think it's harder for a score. Um, I, I, right now it's a novelty thing because, you know, they're doing it. If anybody, if you don't, the audience doesn't know this, but they want to do something a little extra different and special because this is the 50th anniversary of score international. Okay. Um, it is, a, you know, there was another organization that had the Baja 1000, you know, for a few years before score took over Mickey Thompson created score. And mm-hmm. I think it was 1973 or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I guess so. So, um, this is the 50th anniversary of score. So that they wanted to commemorate it with something special, not only, you know, flipping it and having it start down here, but also 1300 miles. Yeah. You know, I I mean, that's 300 extra miles. It's, that's a big race in its own self, usually for most people. (laughs) Yeah. 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 So, um, it's special. Um, will they do it? Uh, well, they don't even do point to points every, every year. They, 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 you know, they at least skip a year or two and then they do it because it's just, it's such an under huge undertaking. But, um, I, if it's really successful and, and, and it works out, I would, I wouldn't be surprised if they maybe alternate the alternates, you know, like where they alternate and have the point to points that every other point to point could do that. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but I'm anxious to see how it turns out because we'll know next week how, how well it went. Oh yeah. I know that's going to be an interesting. And so probably it, we're expecting and predicting that all of the bikes to be home by, by Friday. At well, they have a 50 point. hour time limit. Now let's talk about that for a second. Yeah. That's a uh... 50 hour time limit at 1300 miles works out to be just a hair under 27 mile an hour average. Mm-hmm. 27 sounds like, Oh, that's not very fast. Well, I know from dual sporting, that's your average when you dual sport, um, you know, your hour meter compared to your miles, mm-hmm. it's like, you know, 25 miles an, an hour average motor time. Mm-hmm. Um, history uh, you know, I do, you know, I've been involved with scoring, uh, these races a lot with the tracking and what have you. And uh, I don't think anybody has more BCP in, in tracking knowledge than I do, but, um, I've looked at a lot of tracks and speeds and stuff and, you know, the top motors are 51 miles an hour in the older days when we didn't have these speed limits, um, where they could do a 60 mile section for a hundred miles an hour there. You know, I saw speeds of 57, 58 average. Those days are gone. Um, we're looking at 51, um, top, maybe, maybe you have a certain circumstance, certain course designs, certain weather conditions, certain good riders, uh, maybe hit 53, but we're talking the top teams, 51 in my book, 50, maybe, um, so that's, that's the, you know, the two contenders for the one X plate. Now you go to the, the, the rest of the guys, the 30, 40, 50, 60s, you know, the 50 class, when I used to race 50 class, we were like averaging, you know, 40, 41, you know, the 60 class is probably averaging 38. These are old, but seasoned pros mm-hmm. in their fifties and sixties still doing it. And we can haul ass, um, putting it, you know, racing their hardest, and averaging, you know, 38. So to minimum average 27, that's not much different. I mean, you've yeah. got to be on your game to, to stay ahead of the clock. So I'm really concerned, you know, I'm not concerned, but I'm just like really anxious to see how the Ironman do. There's 26 of them at least trying to do this and trying to maintain that. I don't know how they're going to do it. 
Yeah. You know, I think the attrition rate is going to be huge. Um, I have a number that I think that will make it in, under the time limit. Mm-hmm. That number's not very big. Yeah. Well, that's a, you know, and, and this is a very interesting thing. So you're, you think of the margin of error, right? So these, like you're saying is, is that they, the pace that they carry, you know, they, they can make it, it's already thin, but then you think about all the little things that sometimes go wrong that add up to it. And, you know, it's, it's 10 minutes at a time. Well, yeah, not even what go wrong. Let's just, let's just take that for a second. So compare Let's say you have an Ironman who's, uh, you know, a good rider and is in his early 30s, so he's great shape and he's fast, okay? Mm-hmm. But he's an Ironman. And you compare it to a 30s uh, or, or a 40s um, uh, age group class that's got a team of six guys that are pretty fit. Mm-hmm. So in the, those guys can average, let's say they're averaging, we use 41 miles an hour. Mm-hmm. Now the Ironman guy is capable of, you know, racing against those guys is shorter distance, just as fast, 41 miles an hour. Mm-hmm. But now he's taken on a 1300 mile race. He can't pace at 41 miles an hour. He's got to set his pace. Like I'm comfortable at 35 or 32 or something, you know, 30. In fact, second place Ironman last year mm-hmm. or last point to point, um, was averaging 30 they averaged the second place in the ironman class averaged 30 miles an hour and i think it's 1100 or maybe 1200 miles mm-hmm. um so now your 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 actual riding pace is like 32 but now it's a 50 mile a 50 hour race how do you sleep or whatever i don't know what they, they do or not i know they you know do a lot of caffeine or i don't know what their strategy is but i've seen guys you know they eat food in a pit and they take these long pit stops because oh, i'm an iron man i can afford to take some time to replenish and do all this stuff well if you spend 10 minutes in a pit and you're averaging 30 well that 10 minutes in 50 miles that 10 minutes drops your average from 30 down to 27 yeah even though you're racing you're riding at 30 miles an hour but you took 10 minutes in a pit so these guys have to really think about their strategy to be able to beat the clock mm-hmm. i you know i'm going to say it I think only three will beat the clock. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can, I'm seeing that I can definitely see it as a reality. Just looking at you ride for an hour at 30 miles an hour, and then you end up stopping, like you said, for 10 minutes. So the next hour to make up those 10 minutes, you have to ride at, I don't know, 40 miles an hour, a 40 mile an hour. Yeah. I mean, averages get away from you quickly. If you're done, if you're not moving, yeah. then the clock, your, your average diminishes quickly. Mm-hmm. So these guys have to plan their strategies, their rest stops or how they do it, their food. You know, I would, you know, I would try and do everything my do my resting while the wheels are still turning somehow, yeah. you know, and just going 20 miles an hour and, and sipping down the, or trying to eat a sandwich or something is way better than doing it stopped. Yeah. I mean, and, and it's, you don't like, that is a very valid point. I hadn't thought about that, but that's true. I mean, it's literally like the road sections, the sections that have the 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 speed limits are going to be crucial for that kind of stuff. It's like, well, I could be stopped right now, but I actually should be doing this road section at the speed limit. And I got to figure out how I'm going to get nutrition in because I just just quickly rough numbers, right? 1300 miles, uh, 30 mile an hour average, that's 43 hours. What's going on, guys? Victor with the Chasing Waypoints podcast. All right. Are you looking to promote your brand to a worldwide audience on the podcast? Drop us a line at podcast at chasingwaypoints.com and let's talk. See what we can do about getting you some more ears for your company and getting the word out worldwide. So yeah. like we just said, you 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 take a 10 minute break. And that's clean. One hour. That's it. Yeah. That's if you're having a clean. Everything's clean. You know, they're going to stop and they're going to have to uh, do wheel changes and filters and I mean, typically a bike doesn't go much more than 250 miles on a filter. So yeah. um, there's a lot of filter changes. Yeah. And, and those are, I mean, I don't know. I, I, I'd have to hit a uh, gnarly day where I'm, I'm sure, you know, right. What, you know, okay. So we've made it halfway. It's time to do our quote unquote long pit, you know, so yeah. front, yeah, front and rear will change. Yeah. What are you talking about? You know, that's if you're a, that's if you're 10 a minutes top right there. Team, if you're a top pro team, you can do a rear wheel or wheel change in, in you know, two minutes or whatever, um, 
But if you're an Iron Man with a bunch of friends that are trying to help you and volunteers and they're probably haven't been practicing that, you know, it's easily going to be 10 minutes. Yeah. The reality of, of it being a 10 minute stop. And then that's no electrical issues. That's, you know, yeah. no bent handlebars. That's, you know, com- like things that are maybe a little bit more common on the bikes, you know, from, from going down, you know, got to replace a lever, got to replace a perch, got to, you know, the throttle tube stick in cause it's bent or whatever. I don't know. You know, just all these <clears throat> oh, little random things. A no, it's minute. a huge undertaking. I don't, you know, my, my, I had total admiration for anybody who even signed up for Iron Man because this, this is brutal. This is the most brutal. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm worried for these guys, but I'm proud of them. So, yeah, yeah, it's going to be, this is going to be, I mean, obviously the race up top is going to be huge, right? It's, it's literally to see how fast they can do the peninsula, but then, you know, this peninsula is not as fast as everyone thinks it is right now. <laughs> it's rough out there right now. All the reports I'm getting back are, dude, it's rough. I mean, they're not, they're not fifth gear pinned by any means. You know? Yeah, I've heard, uh, and from the stuff that I've seen, you know, again on the pro moto, uh, pro moto uh, Baja group, the that I've seen is the washouts. Like yeah, we yeah, talked yeah. about earlier, the hurricane went through. It wasn't going to go through without charging, you know, charging the price of admission, which is you know you get uh, washouts and and areas that are cut off, and obviously by the time everybody gets done pre running, they'll be marked. But where that used to be this- flat out. <laughs> It's Let's not. talk about washouts real quick because yeah. I, you know, give me a chance to, to, to put another word of wisdom. Um, when you're free running the first time, uh, this is what I always did. I, I just mainly just get the lay of the land and then I would just take really serious mental note of all the things that could kill me if I forgot that it was there, like a washout. Mm-hmm. Like typically, oh, this is a really fast road. Oh, I'm having fun, just kind of daydreaming, fifth gear, sixth gear pin. If I forget that washout there and I come into it hot like that, I die. So that's it. When you guys are free running, note, most important, really understand where all the things that can kill you are. So you memorize them and go, oh, hey, that, that big washout's coming up in the dust, you know, or yeah. whatever. Yeah. yeah. And Iron Man, I don't know how many Iron Man, there's 26 of them. Mm-hmm. I, be, I bet at least half of them aren't even going to free run. Yeah. Yeah. They're going to try and trail ride it. All the way. I'm just like, you know, what are you going to do? Try and, you know, find lines when you're going 1,300 miles, just trying to survive it? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Man, that, you know, and that's interesting. (laughs) So then, you know, right away there, you think about like, okay, the advantage, you know, it'd be interesting to see that number, right? The difference in the average speed between one lap two laps, three laps, maybe in any one of the other races, right? Where they, they go in pre-run and they do their section four or five times versus oh, yeah. no times, you know, that there's, there's no way that doesn't have an average speed number attached to it. No, there's definitely, when I used to race seriously, I'd do my section six times and I would get to know it so well. And I also go pro it. Mm. And then I'd sit at my desk when I'm supposed to be working and, and pre-run on my computer and just learn my section. And the beauty of it is, do you know how it is when you drive to work the first time you go to a new job and it's a 45 minute drive on a freeway. It seems forever. Mm. Now you've been there for a couple of years. It's like, you just blow through it every, every day. Mm. Like it's nothing. Well, that's what pre-running does. It makes those sections that seem really daunting and long, um, short. Because if you're, you're, it's familiar, but the thing the thing I was going to get to is that um, there's a certain point when you're racing Baja that you're shutting off on on obstacles like a rise or something because you don't really know what's on the other side, so you kind of like back the throttle off a little bit because of, there's a a certain safety factor at this speed versus like how fast I could really go. Even though once you crested that thing, it was a piece of cake wide open. You could have hit it at six gear pin. It would have been nothing, Mm -hmm. but you still, by looking at it, it looks like, you know, if you don't know it, if you don't know how it's just smooth and fast on the other side that you kind of back off and kind of look over the edge as you're cresting it at a slower speed. I call that sight riding. Mm -hmm. Well, when you free run a lot of times, you mentally learn the course so well that you can overcome sight riding and know that, um, that the safe on the other side, well, you're taking chance cause there are always that you yeah. know, donkey or a car coming, but you know, if you're trying to win, you can't be, you know, you're never going to be that safe, you know, otherwise you're not going to ever win. Yeah. But so anyways, I definitely was increasing my speeds by doing, knowing the course so well that, 
I didn't, I was overcoming sight writing and, and knowing how fast I could really go. Yeah. Well, there's, you know, it, it, that's a good point. I, you know, in another group that I'm uh, a part of, it was from Skylar house talking about uh, something about that, you know, we're, you know, following road books and, you know, if the road book doesn't say let off, you don't let off because if I'm letting off, the other guy isn't. And yeah, that's true. One second at a time. That's what it is. And, and like what you're saying is, is I can, uh, what I'm envisioning is there's a difference between checking up and then there's a difference between letting off like engine braking versus, you know, just kind of mellow it out, you know, drop a little bit in the R's, but not full on, you know. It's, yeah, it's psychological. I mean, we do it a lot when we ride. You don't realize it, but a lot of times you don't have the throttle on because you're kind of, you're riding by instinct and your instincts sort of are, for, are, are self-preservation a lot of times. Mm -hmm. So you got to override that to go as fast as these pros go. Yeah. Which I still don't know how they do it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I used to be one when I was a kid. And I don't even know how I did it either. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how you did it. <laughs> but you get to have fun. You got you get to split the duties. You get a day job. And you get oh, to love do it. some I racing. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I'm not an employee. I'm a volunteer. I do it for the love of the sport. And I do it for um, making a difference. And I, and, I, and I have. And I'm really uh, uh, ex proud that score is listening and making adjustments and making it better and you, you can see it and you know, we got 100 entries we didn't we had 32 years ago so i'm 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 thinking that uh, it's making a difference yeah well yeah i mean you've already you know in the in the last couple of years you've already seen the you've seen the difference you know, which is, the attitude which is awesome. shift is huge i mean yeah people aren't score bashing like they were and because you know there's communication now, mm -hmm. you know, they, Oh, they're, they're, they're about, you know, no, this is why, you know, yeah. you know, what would you do? I mean, what are you going to do when, when a farmer locks his gate or in the heat of a heat of blackmails you remember back, uh, there was a San Felipe 250 one year where Sal, the Hito tried to extort him or something. The story I heard, mm -hmm. he said, you know what? Fuck it. And he took that thing and moved it up to Ensenada. I remember, I <laughs> Just remember took the San Felipe to Ensenada. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's when it became the Baja 250 and it wasn't the San Felipe 250 anymore. Yes. I remember that. that. I, I raced that it in a, a 10 That car. was a political thing. Yeah. So yeah. there's a lot that, go, I don't know, you know, I mean, yeah. I mean, I get privy to a lot of information, but nowhere near as much as I, you know, you would think. I mean, I still don't know what goes on behind the scenes on a lot of this stuff and, oh. and it's, and I just think about it. there's a, there's only a, a few employees at score mm -hmm. that actually run this whole thing and do this and lay out the course and everything. It's like, I don't know, six people or something that do this whole race. Yeah. And then they have a lot of other people that are helping and doing their vendors and, and people that are there. But I'm just meaning like the core people that are mm -hmm. running the show. Yeah. The it's organization. Like how do they do it. Yeah. You know, they're all cool. And they're all doing it for the love of the sport. Yeah. But man, it's, but like you said, I mean, it's an undertaking, you know, go pick 1300 miles. <laughs> you, know? yeah. you have to go through every one of those miles, you know, and figure and get out some fresh time. stuff too. There's some new stuff that hasn't been run. I understand. And Oh, what they yeah. did in Loretto is really cool. What was um, I noticed that when the course came out, typically in Loretto, they go through a dump and, and end up on the East or the West side of the highway going North. Um, and this time, and they're going all the way into town mm -hmm. and going on their Malacon as part of the course in Loretta, which has never been done before. And then now they're going up towards um, the crossover that goes to La Parisma nice. on the, on the East side of the highway, uh, all new terrain over there. And I've seen some uh, video of GoPro and stuff. But it looks really super fun. Nice. And challenging. So that was cool. So yeah, for them to lay out this long course and now they got, um, you know, a few nuggets in there that are, are new, you know, race candy. <laughs> yeah. Nice. No, no, no. Yeah. yeah it's going to be crazy. Yeah. Abelardo, you know, Jose G and, and Roto and uh, everybody in the staff, uh, they pour their blood, sweat and tears and pour their heart out into this race. So, you know, lighten up on those guys. <laughs> <laughs> or, Hey, if you think you got it, <laughs> that's a, in my day job, I won't say what, what electric vehicle manufacturer that is, but you know, that we, we have people that say, I, Hey, I know I could fix this problem in 10 minutes. We're always hiring. 
<laughs> so it's yeah. you know uh it, it, it's an interesting thing right it's one thing to bench race and 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 you know be sitting back and not be privy to some of the information and sometimes that's all it is it's just one person one phone call it was one decision and you know everybody on the outside doesn't know that and it made such a big difference and influenced the organization it influenced you know it just could have been somebody that didn't want to you know hey what's in it for me and they didn't like what was in it for them and that's it. That's the end of it. But, you know, for the word to trickle out, you don't want to bash people. You don't want to do all this stuff. So, you know, it's like, hey, we had to make a change. It is what it is. You yeah. Know? And so it, yeah. Yeah. It's it, it's tough. You know, it's never easy for any organization to do that kind of stuff. Well, the, a lot of the naysayers that, are, that have been active on on the Facebook page, that, you know, Promoto Baja Racing Facebook group, it, you know, I see them. I you know I see some of the naysayers have have kind of um, turn change their tune and they're more part of it. Part of it is because we can have a discussion and to actually discuss it and understand and analyze and and contribute. Like, and if they're part of the process, you know everyone benefits that way when people well they're their customers, you know, so they can they, we get feedback and and uh, I don't know. It's just I really feel like the. the 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 attitude the the enthusiasm is really shifted and it's where it should be and it's, it's I'm just really stoked it's gonna be so fun this race is down here I wish you could come down here this yeah. is gonna be so cool I'll do some Facebook lives or something so that you can just see the excitement because yeah. this Malacon is 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 beauty I love it yeah yeah I would love to uh, I would love to be a fly on the wall on some of these uh, WhatsApp groups with updates and stuff like that and. Uh... Oh yeah, we do have a WhatsApp group. It's only limited to like a thousand people. It's probably already filling up, but we got one for the, I got score to make me one. Uh, Could they have like a score official WhatsApp thing for, for status updates and stuff. Nice. And they made it a special, a specific moto quad one. Um, so we can uh, tap into that. You can find the link to that on our pro moto Baja racing group. But, yeah. Um, hopefully, um, you know, people that are really truly interested, don't just get everybody on there that so clogs it up. But. No. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's the, you know, we, we talk about that at some of the rallies, like in the rallies, it's become really popular to do, uh, to, to get a group going because you can disseminate information really, really quickly. Um, uh, but then, you know, sometimes other Facebook groups that we get a part of, you know, where they start off disseminating information, it turns into everybody saying good morning. And you know, <laughs> yeah, it turns into a shit show. Everyone yeah. starts throwing memes and all this other stuff. And exactly. Then, then the next thing you know, they start talking politics, and now it's just gone to shit. Yeah, so. exactly. It's just gone down this rabbit hole, and you're like, okay, how do I delete? I can't delete this fast enough, to <laughs> or I'm going to exit the group. You guys figure it out. <laughs> So, so I need to um, listen to your you know, Gio Spinali podcast. I, I heard about ten minutes of it, and I had to get back to work. But yeah. um, how about that? He almost died the last year's thousand, and here he's back with a team and racing and, and full swing. And dude, really every, excited every time I you know I when I think of you know Giovanni when it's like uh, it, the name comes up or I see a Facebook post of his, I always picture, I always remember the the picture of his bike with the front forks collapsed. I've never or the rock. Did you see the picture of the rock that he hit? Yeah. I've never, I've never seen I that. saw his tracking for that. I think you know, I'm privy to that information. Yeah. 67 miles an hour. If I remember correctly. Yeah. That's just, and, and probably blindsided him. I don't really think he even saw it coming. I mean, just yeah. one minute you're winning your race, you're hauling ass, you're, you know, top 10 overall and doing the, you know, as a 50 class, the next thing you know, you're just, destroyed yeah and and what are and i mean what are we like i saw there was one there was a rock that they just found too in the oh yeah that was brutal yeah um and, and what are you it, talking about that could have the same six inches i mean it's not it's really not i don't know what that one was i mean it's still enough to put you on your head the oh yeah one, geo's but, is taller it's probably you know somewhere in the teens yeah. but um yeah. It, I mean, there's, there's hundreds of those out there though. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the thing. I mean, you've got to miss them. <laughs> yeah. You got to each one of them and those come anywhere. And that was, you know, and it was interesting from talking to, um, I believe it was Matt Sutherland, uh, in yeah. racing the Nora. And the, that was some of the advice that they gave him about, you know, just stay out of the shadows whenever you're riding and, and you're on these roads, stay out of the, the shadow side of the road. And oh yeah, I'll give you a tip. Um, I learned. Yeah. Um, 
So sand washes, you know how they're not straight a lot of times, they twist and turn. Mm -hmm. And what that means is they're going around like a ridge, right? You know, Mm -hmm. like a ridge that comes down into the, and buries itself into the sand. Mm -hmm. So I've learned, you know, from past racing that in those ridges or when that, when you go around a ridge like that, the sand wash goes around it. It's, um, there's a lot of buried rock there in those locations. Mm-hmm. So, you know, in between them is, is softer and less, but there's, a, it's a higher percentage of having a uh, square edge in those locations where the ridge, where the, where the sand wash has to go around a ridge that is diving into the sand. Gotcha. And then the other one like that, um, you mentioned it, like a tree or a shadow. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not necessarily a coincidence that there's a rock where a tree is. Think about think about little seeds that are floating across the desert in the wind, and they hit up against a rock, and they can't go any further, so they bury themselves and, and grow and flourish, and they do. They grow over a rock. Hmm. That's very... Uh... <laughs> It makes sense. It does. I mean, you you put it that way. Yeah, of course. It, you know, I I hadn't thought about it that way. You know, not only that, but now you can't see. And that doesn't mean every tree is going to have a rock there. But you know, no. like you're saying, it's it's all about the percentages. Another trip. I mean, I'm also just you know trying to unload any of these tips that I have in my head because it they could help somebody you know, yeah. or not. But take them for what they're worth. But one of the things is. Um, I don't, in the sand washes, like in the San Felipe, where, where there's a lot of the buried rocks, mm-hmm. I don't ride dead center in one of the two tracks. Um, I tend to ride about halfway up, kind of like at, a, like at an angle, on, like on the sidewall of a two track. And you know how they're shaped, kind of bowl shaped on each mm-hmm. side of a two track. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people ride the center hump, which is good too. But a lot of two tracks will, they'll, they'll split a rock and they'll have a nice big rock in the two track. Mm -hmm. So you got to watch for that. But, but the method or the the theory behind not being at the very bottom of the two track is being halfway up the right, like the outside of it Mm -hmm. is now I'm riding on like a four inch cushion of sand that isn't the very bottom. Mm -hmm. So now when I do hit a rock, that's a ledge that's buried in there. I've got a little bit of a cushion and it doesn't, it's not so abrupt. Yeah. Because you don't see them. I mean, a lot of times you just don't see them. And the next thing you know, you're doing a handstand at 100 miles an hour. <laughs> Which, I mean, and, and and really the issue there is the, I, or what I think, is the difference, right? You come around the corner, it's there. You didn't really pick it up, but it may be the difference of two inches of sand by you riding up on the edge. Is, exactly. Is it, just it just enough. takes, the, it takes the, the edge off of the square edge. Yeah. But the other thing is, you know, even if you are looking for them. If you think about it, especially San Felipe, all the bedrock and square edges are the same color and the same composition of what the loose stuff is made of. Yeah. So that's all the loose stuff is just broken down bedrock mm-hmm. and uh, the hard stuff. So it looks like camouflage. You can't, sometimes you can't see these ledges that are underneath there that are you know comprised of all the same stuff. That's a loose stuff. So you visually you don't even see it. They just catch you off guard. Well, and I have great vision. There's no way they they wouldn't catch me off. Well, uh huh. Yeah, I remember. No. Yeah, go, go race San Felipe. You'll tell me when you're done. Everybody's no. done it. Oh no, no. Everybody's it's, done handstands in San Felipe. Oh, look, it's even easier than that. Remember when you were painting that wall, and then your significant other came in and said you missed a spot, but you swore you got every inch of that wall. Yeah, this is the <laughs> same exact thing. All right, it's you're painting a wall. You're looking at the same color sand for an entire day. In the in the high noon, you know there are no shadows. I mean, this you know. I, in all my years of racing down in Baja, um, more people get hurt pre running in the San Felipe area than any part of the race. Well, except for maybe hitting cows down here where I'm at now. There's a lot of okay. cows in this area, and, yeah. and a lot of people hit cows and they break collarbones or whatever doing that. But yeah. San Felipe is, is watch yourself, San Felipe, and watch yourself at the cows down here. Down there, yeah. Colton, uh, when I had him on the show uh, several episodes back, he mentioned about that being down in that area and the same thing. He, he just at the very last second on that Honda with exactly no more RPM to give to go any faster and just inched by a cow, you know, and, oh, yeah. and you know, obviously there was questions after that <laughs> because there, um, it's crazy. Two years ago when we were down here racing, um, I heard reports that there were some black cows that had white spray paint on them like zebras. So, so the farmers, the farmers are doing it. So they, people don't run over their cows. <laughs> Interesting. 
I mean, it's smart. You know, I don't, I don't know that we want to wrap them in reflective tape, but you know, that's <laughs> <laughs> maybe that, you know, maybe that could be an initiative is, uh, is maybe, uh, get some callers, some reflective callers for race time, put them on, take them off. I'll tell you what we were talking about today. We're, we're out and about today. We were talking about the cattle cause I was being, you know, getting reports back. There's a lot of cattle after the, the, the step up, you mm-hmm. know, there's, um, so, um, no, what do they call it? The steps, I guess. You know, um, and after that, when you're heading towards the coast, there's a lot of there's been some range cattle. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the things we were talking about today, I don't know if it's work or not, but it's just an idea we had. And in the Midwest, there's a lot of deer that run across the road at night, and so they put deer whistles on their cars, which are these little whistles that the wind, of the, the speed of the car creates a wind thing. It spins it, and it makes a high pitched maybe subsonic that we can't hear, mm-hmm. but it, the deer can hear it and it you know, alerts them to the car coming and they, maybe that voids them. Mm-hmm. I wonder if that would work for cattle, but deer whistles on our bikes or something. Yeah. That would, you know, it would be an interesting, because I wonder how that is, right? Like you think about how loud a bike is at speed and. But you don't, they're behind the noise is behind it kind of you know it kind of yeah they don't really i don't know yeah that's you know yeah that that's a good the noise is the noise is behind i mean you can kind of hear them where they're coming but then you also have to think is like okay well the cow just knows there's something i hear this noise i don't know what to do i'm just gonna go that way well that way happens to be right across <laughs> yeah, the road they're really unpredictable yeah and you don't and, know which way they're gonna dart my, you know, it's interesting. My dad has a story where he, he ran into Ivan Stewart at a, at, I think it was at an airport or, you know, they were traveling, I think to SEMA or something like that. And they were talking about cattle on the road and about mm-hmm. why they're always on the side of the road. And it's because of the water runoff and the green, the vegetation is always there. Yeah, that too. And also, I, I don't know, sometimes it's, you know, it could be the, like the road holds the heat too. If it's cold out, then it's warmer by the road asphalt. Oh yeah. Especially yeah, now. All that. Man, it's crazy. Then, then is, it's, if it's fence line, then they get, you know, they go through a hole in the fence and now they're on the wrong side of the fence and they're like channeled into the road. And yeah. And then the worst part about that is, is if you're a racer and out of your peripheral, you're seeing a fence, you're thinking you should be good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, the, the moral of the story is when in Baja, watch out. <laughs> There's so much to it. I mean, if you can survive the first one, you'll be hooked for life and then you coming back for more of the rest of your life. I know, right? No. Awesome. All right, Andy, you got a, uh, you got some sleep and you got some pre-running to do tomorrow, right? Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be fun. I love being on the bike down yeah, here. That's going to be awesome. Well, we're looking forward to the posts, the updates. I'll be keeping an eye on the, uh, pro yeah, I'll try and do as much as I can and get, you know, bring, bring as much of this race to the public. Um, I just, you know, I'm privy to some really great views. Um, you know, during the race, I mean, during the helicopter rides, I try to bring as much as I can with it unless we're doing work, but yeah. if we're not, I'll try and bring it and get it uploaded as quick as possible. So you guys can see the action. Yeah. No, this is going to be, this is going to be epic. That's going to be really awesome. And I mean, that's uh hats off to you for what you've done and, and, you know, getting, getting the groups going, getting the prize money together. Obviously all of these guys, you know, uh, taco moto, a new, uh, AHM and then Baja bound, of course. Yeah. You know, stepping up to the plate. That is awesome. You know, they're all really, they're, they're, they're all enthusiasts. They all want to give back to the sport that we all love. And this was a way that it worked out really well for everybody. Yeah. It's going to be, it's going to be awesome. I can't, I can't wait to see it, man. There's going to be, (laughs) there's going to be some racing. (laughs) I'm I'm giddy. I can't, you know, you can hear it in this interview. I'm just, I'm stoked. Yeah. So we got a a couple more days. (laughs) Feel free to check back awesome. with me, though. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'll bug you. <laughs> All right. Awesome, Andy. Well, you have a good evening. Good luck for running tomorrow, and uh, we're looking forward for the updates. Thanks, man. We'll see you in the Sonata. Awesome. awesome, man. See ya. Bye. 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 All right. So there you have it. Andy Kirker from Score International Pro Moto Baja Racing Facebook Group organizer and Moto Racer. He is back. Going to be uh, taking the green flag in La Paz in a few days. So this is going to be awesome to see that and have him out there on the course, you know, getting, uh, getting after it, getting to run some of those sections down there. So I think it'll be, I think it's going to be awesome. Like I said, it's going to be a lot of great racing, 1300 miles headed North, uh, 50th anniversary four score international, which is absolutely awesome. And yeah, hats off to all of these guys, you know, uh, taco moto stepping up to the plate first on bat and then AHM. Baja Bound Insurance, Anu, all these guys, you know, stepping up and helping, helping the class, getting some, uh, get some prize money out there. It's awesome to see, you know, you got Mark Samuels, 
uh, teaming up with Arturo Salas. Arturo Salas joining that team, as mentioned at the top of the show, uh, talking about Carter Klein uh, partnering with uh, Chavo Salatierra uh, to do their, you know, get their racing effort in there. Uh, it's going to be, it's going to be awesome. I'm absolutely looking forward to it. I'm absolutely looking forward to some really good racing in the moto side of it. And, you know, let's see what, uh, let's see what happens. We got some Iron Man guys that we're going to be tracking. I, I really want to pay particular attention to that because if you guys, you know, how we were talking about that, it is going to be the numbers game. It is absolutely the numbers game on how much time you can lose. We were just actually literally last night, uh, I was down at Baja Adventure Garage and they're getting ready to do their first rally uh, that I'll be helping them with. And that was, that was the very, very common theme. You know, it's not a race. It's a fun ride. There is time uh, that, that it's are going to be looked at, but it's all about not losing time. You know, that 10 minute stop, that five minute stop, that three minute stop, you know, whatever it is, it's all about conserving the time. And that's the name of the game for these guys in the Ironman class. You know, we talked about with Andy, you know, it's where can you do things that you would normally be stopped for that you can do and keep the bike moving. And it may not seem like it, but, you know, keeping the bike moving is just those two more miles closer than you would have been normally. You know, if, uh, if we think about it, you know, 30 miles an hour, that means you do a mile every two minutes, you know, 60 miles an hour. You do, obviously you do a mile a minute. So, what are you doing? You know, what, how, how are you clicking off of those miles to get you to that goal? And like you said, he's thinking maybe only three guys making it under the time limit. So 30 mile an hour average, 43 hours, but that means it is you just strung together 1300 plus miles of perfection to nail that 30 mile an hour average. Not a lot of room. So with that being said, guys, remember it'll make sense when you get there. Enjoy the ride. All right, that is a wrap for the Chasing Waypoints podcast. Hope you guys enjoyed the show. Looking forward to our next one coming up. Remember, if you are out riding, do not forget to tag us at Chasing Waypoints. Hashtag Chasing Waypoints. And if you haven't already, get on over to the website. Get signed up for the newsletter, The Bivouac. North America's Rally Raid and Adventure Riding newsletter hey let's have some fun let's find out what are you guys up to let's get you featured if you're a brand and looking to get supported get some eyeballs get some ears on your business absolutely hit us up send us a message at podcast at chasing waypoints but anyway that is a wrap remember shiny side up see you guys